So, uh, so two things before we start. Uh, firstly, thank you very much indeed uh, to the organizing committee for this invitation to this very interesting looking conference. And uh, thank you also to all the people on Zoom and in the room there. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and of course, secondly, I, uh, I apologize that I'm not there in person, uh, but actually, I think John Baez, who might be in the room. Hi, John, if you're there. Hi, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I watched a talk by John uh, a few months ago at the Topos Institute, and he was talking about what mathematicians can do uh, to, you know, we have this impending potential climate disaster. And uh, he argued that one of the few things we can do is to think very carefully about whether we should be flying here, there and everywhere. And uh, and so I've had it as a, as a partially as a result of John's talk. Uh, I've I've been thinking very very hard about flying, uh, and I've decided that I couldn't really justify yet. And you know, I would personally like to be there, but sometimes it's not just about me. So I'm sorry I can't meet uh, several people there that I would really have loved to have met in person. Okay, so. On to Groth and Deke. So uh, let's start with a cool mathematical fact, which I knew uh, when I was in, I guess, when I was in primary school. So in the UK, we changed schools at around 11, 12. So when I was 11 years old, I knew the following fact, uh, which was if you knew the last digit of two positive integers, then you knew the last digit of their product. So if you know that A ends in seven and B ends in four, uh, then A times, I don't know what A and B are, I just know that A ends in seven and B ends in four, then their product A times B is guaranteed to end in eight. And uh, the reason I knew that uh, when I was in elementary school, primary school, whatever you call it, uh, is that I had been taught an algorithm uh, for multiplying uh, numbers together. Uh, so column multiplication and the way the algorithm starts is you take the last digit of the first number and the last digit of the second number so seven and four and you multiply those together and you get 28 when you put down eight and carry two and then you do many many more steps uh, but you can easily check that all of those other steps they never change that last digit that last digit is now set in stone and so even though I knew nothing about congruences or number theory or anything like this, I could see by inspecting the algorithm that if A ends in seven and B ends in four, then A times B definitely is gonna end in eight. Even though I don't know what A and B are, uh, knowing partial information about A and B, in this case gives me partial information about the product. And so as I say, you can, you can prove this mathematical fact by looking at the algorithm. And then later on, I went to secondary school and I was involved with this, you know, math Olympiad, which is something that I kind of have mixed feelings about. But uh, uh, when, when I was at school, it did me the world of good because it was, you know, stretching me in ways uh, which school somehow wasn't stretching me. And so when I was 17 years old, I was taken off on some training weekend and I was told about the integers modulo 10. And the integers modulo 10 a sort of a different way of thinking about the same kind of thing. The integers modulo 10 are a system of numbers. Uh, they're, cl they're closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Uh, they're, a, they're a finite ring. And uh, um, my model for the integers modulo 10 was just the set of numbers from zero to nine. Uh, so this was absolutely my model uh, for the integers modulo 10. And the way this thing works is that there's some kind of wrap around, right? If you go past, I mean, you want to do addition and two out two is four, that's fine. And you know, four out of five is nine. Uh, but what happens when you go past nine, right? Nine add one, the idea is you, you wrap around, you imagine the numbers are in some kind of a ring and uh, after nine comes zero again. Uh, so this is the idea, you could think about it like that. Uh, you, uh, so, you know, given a regular integer, there's some kind of, you know, some kind of avatar of this regular integer and you you get it by dividing by 10 and uh, looking at the remainder or just looking at that last digit so you know the real integer 37 it has some kind of representation uh, 
in this in this finite system of numbers and it's uh, and it's just seven so we can define addition and we can define multiplication and the way i used to think about this my model for addition and multiplication was you know you go off the top and you appear again at the bottom uh, and so you can do things like nine plus one nine plus one used to be 10 in the regular integers but nine plus one is going to be zero in the integers modulo 10 and nine plus two is one because you know, the, the number after nine is zero and the number after zero is one and a more complicated problem like seven fours uh, seven fours are going to be 28 but 28 you've kind of got off the top you've come back to the bottom again then you've gone off the top again and you've come back to the bottom again and uh, so seven times four is equal to eight. And this is a more conceptual way of thinking about this fact that I was telling you about earlier. Here we actually have a system of numbers where seven times four is actually equal to eight. It's not just this ends in seven and this ends in four, so this ends in eight. This is a, a different way of thinking about things. But as I say, as a, as a secondary school kid, uh, I learned about you know, this, new, this new model, this new system uh, of arithmetic, a system of numbers, you know, a, a finite ring. And another way of, you know, computing computing this thing is you do, to do seven times four. First of all, we could do the real seven times four, which is 28. And then we can divide by 10 and take the remainder and then we get eight. And that's the answer to seven times four in this system of numbers. And now there's a slightly strange fact about this, this system of numbers, or at least the way I'm thinking about this system of numbers, there's something slightly uncomfortable about this, is that seven and four, I'm imagining seven and four to be you know, representing integers modulo 10, but they're also integers. So now we have two answers for seven times four. This is a little bit weird, right? So seven times four we know is 28. Uh, but if we're thinking of seven and four as being integers modulo 10, then we, we somehow are saying, well, if we're imagining them to be representing different things, now all of a sudden, seven times four, the answer is different. And this is maybe a little bit strange because now there seems to be you know, seven and four, they haven't changed. The question hasn't changed, but the answer seems to have changed. This is you know, maybe slightly surprising. Uh, and then I went to university. I mean, I didn't care about this philosophical objection when I was at school because I, you know, because uh, I was just, yeah, I just, I, I took, I took it on. I, I, it's just okay. That's how it works. But at university, I was offered yet another way to think about this fact uh, that if a number ends in seven and another number ends in four, then the product ends in eight. So at university, I was told the correct way to think about things, and the correct way to do these things uh, is that we learn, you know, the integers modulo ten something called a quotient ring and uh, we're now told that they're not this set zero one two three four five six seven eight nine they're not they're no longer the subset of the integers but the correct way to think about the integers modulo 10 uh, is these 10 things here and it looks very similar to what i was talking about before but there's these kind of strange boxes have appeared so we now have box one and box two uh, and box seven and things like this uh, so what the heck are these boxes? What's going on here? Uh, this object now, this box seven, it's not the number seven anymore. It's something different. It's, it's called an equivalence class. So this is something I knew nothing about at school, but learned about very, very quickly at university. It was one of the first things we were taught. It's an equivalence class. So what it really is, is it's representing all of those numbers which map to seven, all of the integers that end in seven. I mean, uh, I don't I don't particularly want to talk about negative integers because they're not really relevant to the story. But, you know, before seven, we have negative three and negative 13. But all the positive integers that end in seven and all the negative integers which have remained a seven when you divide them by 10 for some appropriate definition of remainder. All of those things there, they're all represented at once by one thing called seven with a box around it. So it's no longer a number. It's now an infinite set. OK, that's great. So. Uh, so how does this work now? The correct way of doing it, you know, the official Cambridge University officially correct way of thinking about the integers modulo 10, which I had drummed into me as an undergraduate. How do you multiply seven by four now? Uh, this new way, the way it works 
is you, you've got this box seven, this box contains infinitely many numbers. So we just need to take an element from this box. So we could take, for example, the number 37, that would work. Uh, and then uh, we take an element from the four box, so an, an, an integer who, which ends in four, for example, 204. Uh, so now we've got representatives for these equivalence classes. And now the next thing we do is we multiply those numbers together. So we do 37 times 204. We can figure that out using column multiplication. And we get 7,548. That's great. And then we ask ourselves, which box is that in? Right? That number ends in eight, which means it's in the eight box. Right? There it is. Mm -hmm. Eight, 18, 28. You keep going. Eventually, you're going to get to 7,548. Uh, and so because we started with something in the seven box and something in the four box, we multiplied them together and we got something in the eight box. You see, this is this basic fact that I'd known since I was 11, but just being recast now in this highly abstract way. And because that's the way it works, we say that box seven times box four is box eight. And this and this we, we've resolved that philosophical problem that we had earlier about number seven times number four, because this is weird seven, right? This is seven with a box and box around it and four, four in a box. So we can define seven in a box times four in a box any way we like, and we're gonna define it to be eight. So unfortunately, there's a philosophical problem with this definition as well, or at least a, a theoretical problem, is that we, we have to check that what we did just there was well-defined, this dreaded concept of being well-defined. We had a definition but apparently some definitions are better than others. Some definitions are well-defined. And this definition I just gave you was apparently not well-defined. And what does that mean? Well, I chose 37 and 204. What if I'd chosen some other number that ends in seven, some other number that ends in four? And what if I multiplied those numbers together? And you know, the answer is you, you're still gonna get eight in a box. That whatever the product of those two large numbers in, we know it's gonna end in eight because it all goes back to this thing you know, this thing that I'd realized when I was 11 years old, you apply the algorithm and the algorithm tells you that this number is going to end in eight. So multiplication is well defined. That's great. Uh, and now, of course, now I teach this stuff. And I've also discovered another problem with this definition, which uh, is that, in fact, when you try and tell undergraduates that you make a definition and then you've got to check it's well defined. You know, some of these people are clearly going to be thinking, why are we wasting our time doing this crazy abstract way? When, in fact, the model I had as a, as a high school kid, that model works perfectly well, right? That model works perfectly well. You do seven folds, you go off the top, you come back again on the bottom, and it's fine. And, and who cares about this weird concept of being well-defined and defining functions from quotients? So there you go. Great. We have quotients. This is this is the thing we learn at university. The idea is we have a set like the integers, uh, but it, it unfortunately there are things in that set that we really want to treat as equal, like seven and thirty-seven. Uh, I want them to be equal, but they're not equal, right? They're not the same as integers. So we want to have a new notion of equality on this old set. Uh, and you know, for, you know the, the example that I've been running with, if we only actually care about the last digit of a number, then all these numbers that end in seven, that they're, they're not equal, but we want to pretend that they're equal, even though we know they're not equal. But we have this equivalence relation of being congruent modulo 10. Uh, and you know, we could we could do it the way I learned at school, this hack, this subset way, where we choose our favorite element in each equivalence class. Or we can do it the quotient way, you know, where we define this equivalence relation and then, and then we define the quotient to be the set of equivalence classes. That works great if you're doing set theory. If you're doing type theory, you might have another model for a quotient, uh, but we'll have this quotient where things that didn't used to be equal uh, now become equal. And so now the question is, this way I learned at school and this way I learned at university, are those two ways themselves equal? Right. So this is a, a different kind of equality. I'm not asking if seven is equal to 37. I'm asking if my two models are equal. Right. Is that is that is that model of Z mod 10 I had as a school child? Is it equal to that model that I was being told was the correct model at university? So this is a different kind of equal. Right. Uh, and and this this question is slightly problematic. Are, they, are these two things equal? 
And so we could go to a set theorist uh, because a set theorist, you know, I'm using the set theoretic notation and a set theorist has a very well-defined concept of what it means for two things to be equal. And they will tell you straight away that these two things are not equal, right? So I've been, you know, university is telling me that I need to change my model of the integers modulo 10 to a different model, which isn't equal. This talk is about equality, and this is somehow a, our first baby concept uh, where things start getting a little bit thorny, right? Uh, well, you know, an undergraduate might know enough language to say that, well, it doesn't, you know, they, they might not be equal, but for sure they're isomorphic, right? These are both rings, you know, seven times four was eight in the, in the, in the, in the school ring, and then in the university ring, we have box seven times box four is box eight. And so the multiplications kind of match up, right? These things match up. These things, they're not equal, but they're isomorphic as rings, right? And then, of course, you get some, some PhD student who's been to a few algebra courses or some algebraic geometry courses, and they'll helpfully tell you that, in fact, they're not just isomorphic. They're canonically isomorphic as rings. Uh, did I, I heard somebody yell, was that, I'm assuming that that wasn't somebody passing out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak a lot about canonical later on, uh, but it's all right, as an undergraduate, I was told these things were canonically isomorphic. Uh, and the one thing that everyone agrees on uh, is that they do represent the same mathematical idea, the concept of you know, the integers modulo 10. And more recently, I've learned about this breed of people called homotopy type theorists, and the homotopy type theorists would actually give you a different answer to the set theorists. The homotopy type theorists, uh, they would tell you that actually, uh, because these rings are representing the same mathematical idea, actually, uh, these two these two models, these two rings, they really are equal. So we can find different people who are claiming to be mathematicians, mm -hmm. but are using different foundations and are actually giving you different answers to this question <coughs> as to whether these two objects are equal. <clears throat> so this is something we're going to come back to. Okay, so I've mentioned equality, and now the question is, what do we want from equality? Uh, and one thing that would be nice to have would be a definition. Uh, it would be, be nice to have a formal definition of equality. So if we talk to the set theorists, set theory is a wonderful model for essentially all of mathematics. Uh, and in set theory, we've got a definition of equality. In set theory, it turns out that every single object you consider is a set, uh, and sets have got elements, and two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. Uh, and uh, this is one of the axioms of zamelo frankel set theory. Uh, and so when you take this very literal, uh, this very literal definition of equality coming from set theory, we have two sets here. And these sets are definitely not equal because, you know, one of them contains the number seven and one of them contains this thing box seven, uh, which is a collection of infinitely many, uh, infinitely many numbers. And so, you know, that number seven and that, and that infinite set box seven are definitely not equal. Uh, so they're different models of the integers, uh, but it's okay because you can have distinct models which are not equal as far as set theory is concerned. So that's great. So we have a, you know, if we're gonna model mathematics in set theory, uh, then we have a rigorous definition of equality and we can answer this question definitively, these things are not equal. So that's one thing that is nice to have from equality is a rigorous definition. But there's something else that actually, as I've discovered, um, I should say that I, I now spend a lot of my time doing mathematics uh, in, a, in a computer theorem prover. And one of the things that you discover very, very quickly uh, when you start doing mathematics in a computer theorem prover is that a key thing that we use over and over and over again, often without even noticing in mathematics, uh, is something you know, called the substitution property. And so what does the substitution property say? Well, it says if you've got two mathematical objects, A and B, and if A and B are equal, then the idea is whatever we can say about A, uh, we can say the same things about B. And if something is true for A, then it's going to be true for B. So we can try and formally write down what this substitution property is. And it says something like this, we have two mathematical objects, A and B, and if A and B are equal, uh, 
then for any statement that we can make about mathematical objects, uh, if, if that statement is true for A, then that statement had better also be true for B. So there's a, a slightly informal statement of the substitution property for equality. Uh, but you see, it raises another question, which is what, it, what, what, what do we mean here by a statement, a statement about mathematical objects? What does that actually mean? Well, uh, the, the, you know, the answer to that question is, well, actually, uh, precisely what we're allowed to say about mathematical objects, that's going to depend on our foundations. So we have to go back to say, well, what foundations are we using here? And once we've chosen our foundations, uh, we then get a concept of equality and we get a substitution property and the substitution property will be valid uh, uh, because we will also have a formal definition of what the kind of things we're allowed to say about mathematical objects. And what's happening is that, you know, I gave you this example, my two models of the integers modulo 10, a set theory says they're not equal, but a homotopy type theory says they are equal. And so homotopy type theorists are allowing more equalities than set theorists. So that means that their substitution property is more powerful and, and they somehow, they deal with this by allowing fewer statements to be made. Uh, so Deline described this as a, being kind of an Orwellian take on mathematics, we're somehow reducing the kind of statements which are which are valid mathematical statements, uh, because some statements that we might want to make in set theory, uh, they are, you know, it's decreed that these statements are not symmetric enough. You know, they're not really, uh, they shouldn't be allowed in the homotopy type theory model of mathematics, and so you you discover that you no longer can even say them. Uh, any more of these statements. So it's kind of a, you know, a new speak kind of way of thinking about mathematics. So of course, most mathematicians in practice, they're not particularly, you know, what I'm doing here is I'm taking, I'm trying to say what mathematics is, and then I'm going right to the boundary. I'm really trying to push the definition of mathematics and say, well, he's, you know, here's a crazy thing that no mathematician would ever say. Is that a valid mathematical statement? You know, and, and different people with different foundations might have different opinions about this, but of course, most working mathematicians don't do, they don't push the language of mathematics like that. They just trust their intuition. And this kind of question doesn't really arise for them. So now finally, I'm on to Grothendieck. I'm supposed to be talking about Grothendieck. So here we are. Uh, Grothendieck, uh, he uses, uh, what, what are the foundations which Grothendieck is using? Well, if you read his work, we'll see some of his work later. Uh, if you read his work, you will discover that the language he uses is the language of set theory. So we can reasonably assume uh, that his foundations, at least at the beginning, uh, when he was thinking about, you know, in the early 60s, when he was revolutionizing algebraic geometry, uh, he was perhaps thinking about algebraic geometry as all happening within set theory. So he's using set theoretic language, uh, but the thing I learned relatively recently, uh, which is embarrassing because I've been reading Grothendieck for decades, uh, Grothendieck's use of equality does not conform uh, to the set theoretic, uh, you know, the, the, the ex axiom of extensionality, this, uh, this, this characterization of equality which the set theorists have. Grothendieck uses equality in a different way, and this rather surprised me. So, as I say, I'm not suggesting that this is a brilliant observation due to me. No doubt this was well known for a very long time, uh, but I didn't spot this. Uh, when I was reading his work quite extensively, uh, because I used algebraic geometry uh, in my <coughs> PhD. And uh, how did I discover this? I discovered this fact the hard way uh, when I was translating Grothendieck's work uh, into a computer theorem prover, into the lean theorem prover. I was teaching lean uh, about schemes and other algebra geometric things. And I was translating what Grothendieck did, and I ran into this issue that Grothendieck did, he did something and I was trying to explain it to Lean and Lean was like, well, you know, you, you, you're claiming that these things are equal, but actually, can you prove that they're equal? And then I'm kind of stepping back and I'm looking at these things and thinking, oh crap, actually these things are not actually equal according to the set theorists. So this is an example we're gonna see uh, right now. So here's the mathematical <coughs> background. Uh, of this, of this weird thing that I discovered and no doubt many, many people discovered uh, many times 
uh, before me. So I, before I explain it, I need to talk about localization and the basic setup here. The, this is the simplest possible setup. This goes back to Diophantus. Uh, you know, we see the positive integers in Euclid, uh, but uh, Diophantus wanted to solve uh, polynomial equations. And for him, it was more convenient because he was doing uh, multiplication. For him, it was very convenient to have division. And if we've got positive integers, then we can't do division. We can't do one divided by two because one and two are positive integers, but one divided by two is not. So how are we going to make a half, or more generally, how are we going to make the collection of all positive rational numbers? Uh, well, one thing we could do is we could make a preliminary definition. We could define a positive rational. What, what We look at a positive rational. What do we see? We see a numerator <coughs> and a denominator. So let's just define a positive rational to be an ordered pair n comma d with n the numerator and d the denominator. So that's that would work fine. Uh, and so, it, it, I mean, it looks like initially like it works fine. Certainly every positive rational uh, is an ordered pair. So let's use the standard notation n over d for this ordered pair n comma d in our preliminary definition of positive rationals. And here's the problem uh, is that unfortunately it doesn't work uh, because a half and two quarters, that, those are the same fraction uh, but unfortunately, uh, the ordered pairs 1, 2 and 2, 4, they're not the same ordered pair. So we've seen this issue already in this talk, right? What are we? The, the, the problem is we want things to be equal, and they're not equal. So our naive definition as ordered pairs doesn't work. And so the fix is we just define an equivalence relation, and we take the quotient. So we'll define two ordered pairs to be equivalent. Uh, a comma B equals C comma D. If A times D equals B times C, this is familiar. Anyone who's ever cleared denominators and tried to figure out if two fractions are equal has seen this equivalence relation before. So for example, one times four equals two times two, which means that one comma two and two comma four are now gonna be equivalent. We'll define the positive rationals to be the equivalence classes, and this works. We get a nice model uh, of the positive rationals. So, okay, so that's how you make division happen in a place where you don't normally have division. So now let me talk about this incredible insight of Rothendieck <laughs> that there's this duality uh, between geometry and algebra. We, we start with a space and uh, people were considering spaces way before Grothendieck, you know, for example, a metric space or a topological space or a discrete space. And then we can look at the functions of this space, for example, the continuous functions or the differentiable functions or you know, the, the real valued functions and the functions on a space, uh, because we can do addition and negation and multiplication on the reals, if we look at the real valued functions on a space or the differentiable real valued functions on a space, the functions on a space form a ring. Uh, uh, and Grothendieck observed the converse. If you start with the ring, then Grothendieck made a space called the spectrum of that ring. This is you know, the first example of a scheme, an affine scheme. And Grothendieck defined what the functions on this spectrum were, and it turned out that the functions on this spectrum turn out to be the ring again. Uh, so he's gone the other way. Given a space, we can make a ring, but Grothendieck says, given a ring, we can make a space. And he observes that you take the functions on the space, you recover the ring. Uh, and in fact, Grothendieck did much more than just defining the functions of the space. Grothendieck defined uh, a sheaf of rings <coughs> in the space. And what that means in practice is that he, he didn't just say what the functions on the space were, he could tell you what the functions on any open set were. Given a, given a subset of this space, uh, he could tell you what the functions of this subset were, as long as it's an open subset. So I, I need to tell you about Grothendieck's formula to explain properly this problem with equality. So the idea is that the functions on the space, uh, the functions on the full space, the, the full spectrum spec R of the ring R, but now let me talk about uh, an open subset of this spectrum. So let's take a function in the space. Uh, f, f is an element of the ring. And so that means that f is a function on the space. And I want to think about dividing by f. But of course, you, know, you can't divide by zero, right? In that previous stuff, when I was talking about positive rationals, I was very carefully avoiding zero. I was pretending to be a Diophantus who didn't know that zero existed. So f is a function on this space, and f might be zero at some points in this space, and so we can't divide by f yet, and so we need to throw away those points. So let's consider, let's consider the subset of this space, the subset of the spectrum where f is non-zero, 
and we'll give this a name d of f this is going to come up a few <coughs> times right d of f is the is the open subset of my space where the function f does not vanish and the reason that we restrict to this subset uh, is because now all the functions that were on the full space we can restrict them to give us functions on the subset but now you've got a new function on this subset d of f uh, because all of a sudden f is non-vanishing everywhere on that subset so we should we should be able to divide by f we should be able to take the inverse of f and that should be a new function that maybe wasn't there before so it's not just one over f we want what kind of things do we want well we, you know we we want to divide we don't just want to divide by f we want to divide by if we divide by f we can divide by f again and we get one over f squared or 23 over f to the 37 you know all of these things and we want to be functions and so now we can step back and say well actually what what are we what are the, what's the full collection of allowable functions uh, on this set d of f where suddenly F, f is allowable we need to we need to definitely force uh division by f we need to be able to force that into our uh into our system and i've shown you how to do that right? i've shown you how to make division happen uh, we do it by this we say well what are we going to allow for numerators and what are we going to allow for denominators and for numerators we just may as well allow all the functions we have already so our numerators are going to be elements of my ring r but now denominators, I'm kind of happy to have f as a denominator and more generally powers of f. And so numerators are going to be elements of R and denominators are going to be powers of f. And so now what we do, we take the product of those two sets and that's a little bit too big. Um, and, then we take a, and then we take a quotient. So we take a quotient. Uh, you know, and the idea is we have an ordered pair consisting of an element of R and a power of f. And then two quotients, we, we say what it means for two quotients to be equal. And then we define this quotient space to be the functions on D of F. So that's great. That's what Grothendieck wrote down. And that sounds great. And now let's, let's go back to the theme of equality. And now let's think about the following question. Let's say we've got two different functions, F not equal to G. Uh, but let's say those different functions, they happen to vanish at the same points, they have the same zero. So different functions, the same zeros. And this can definitely happen. And let's look at a very simple example. Let's look at, you know, let's let our ring be the ring of polynomials in one variable, one variable T. Then here are some polynomials. These are <coughs> our ring, T minus 23 times T minus 37 <coughs> squared, or T minus 23 <coughs> cubed times T minus 37. These are for sure, these are different polynomials. They represent different functions. However, when do these functions vanish? Well, they both only vanish at 23 and at 37. So they're distinct functions, but unfortunately for us, the spaces uh, where they vanish uh, coincide. And so the spaces where they are non-vanishing also coincide. So suddenly two things weren't equal. F was not equal to G, but D of F, the space where F does not vanish, and D of G, the space where G does not vanish, those spaces are equal. And so now we have Grothendieck's recipe for defining functions on this space. And when we think of this space as being D of F, the recipe we get uh, is that the functions on this space are R1 over F. So a quotient of a product of things involving a bunch of powers of F. But when we think of this space as being D of G, we get a different recipe. We get powers of G, not powers of F. You can see no power of F is a power of G, right? And no power of G is a power of F in the examples I gave. Uh, and so Grothendieck gives us two different recipes for computing the functions on the same space. One of these recipes is a quotient of you know, R cross the powers of F. And the other one is a quotient of R, R cross the powers of G. And now, now we can go over to the set theorists and say, are these recipes equal? And the set theorist, and Grothendieck, remember, was using set theory. The set theorist will tell us that these rings are not equal, which is kind of interesting because we've now just defined, we've now just defined the functions on two space. You know, we've got one space, two definitions of the functions on this space, and <coughs> those two definitions are not equal. Okay, but it's okay. They're isomorphic, right? Now this is a theorem. A relatively straightforward theorem you can prove in ring theory if f and g are contained in precisely the same prime ideals then one can write down a canonical isomorphism 
between these two localizations. So these rings are isomorphic for sure, but being isomorphic is weaker to being equal if you're a set theorem. So now this is a serious logical issue, right? We have a, a definition due to a genius. And now this definition looks like it fails this weird, not this well-defined thing. We thought about our space in one way, we got one answer. We thought about the same space in a different way, we got a different answer. So these things are not well-defined. The functions on D of F are R1 over F. The functions on D of G are R1 over G. D of F equals D of G, but R1 over F is not equal to R1 over G. They're both modeling the same idea. But who cares about modeling the same idea? We have broken the principle of substitution, right? And that is a foundational thing, which is supposed to be always true in our model of mathematics. So here's an explicit, an explicit example of breakage, right? Let P of X be the following statement. X is a space and the functions on F, sorry, the functions on X are equal to R1 over F, right? That's, that's for sure a perfectly valid mathematical statement, right? We can say in mathematics, let's just be, let X be a space, let X be a scheme or whatever you want to make, you know, and let's assume that the functions on X, let's assume that the global sections of X are equal to this ring R1 over F, right? Well, unfortunately, P of D of F is true, P of D of G is false, but D of F equals D of G. So this violates a foundational principle, you know, if you like an axiom, uh, of our foundational system. But Grothendieck was aware of this, right? He was just not too bothered, which is kind of interesting. So let's have a look at what Grothendieck actually wrote. Uh, so here's a bunch of stuff written in French. This is from uh, EGA1, one of the first, uh, one of the first things uh, that he wrote, I guess. Uh, I guess you can see my, you, here's my mouse here. I, I forgot to circle this thing, but he's talking about l'ensemble multiplicative, he's talking about a set, right? So he's clearly using set theory as his foundations, but here are the two things I want to flag. Uh, we have this word canoniquement, and I think this is the first, I looked around, I think this is the first time that this word occurs in Grothendieck's EGA. So he's claiming that, that, uh, that, that certain things, maybe they're not equal, but they can be canonically identified. This is what he says, and then five lines later, all of a sudden, these things which have become canonically identified, all of a sudden they're equal. He's using this equality symbol. Whoa. No definition of canonical, uh, but it's okay. They can be canonically identified so they're equal. So this isn't actually formally true as far as set theory is concerned, but Grothendieck is arguing it's kind of okay because they can be canonically identified, these objects, they're canonically isomorphic. So Grothendieck, uh, you know, developed, uh, he went on in EGA and SGA to develop um, cohomology theories. And one of the cohomology theories he developed was a tal cohomology in the 60s. Uh, and by the late 60s, he was beginning to prove the Vey conjectures. Uh, and then his student, Deline, went on in the 70s to prove all the Vey conjectures using et al. cohomology. Uh, and so it was realized by the mathematical community uh, that et al. cohomology was a pretty important thing. And so, of course, by the 1980s, uh, textbooks are appearing about et al. cohomology. And one of them was written by Jim Milne. And this is a quote uh, from Milne's. It's rather grossy. This was the best I could find. It's rather grossy, uh, uh, five lines, uh, not particularly uh, 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 yeah, sorry, uh, it's, a, it's a somehow a lousy scan, but, Groth uh, but Milne says, this is his note, this is right at the beginning of the book, he's, expla he's explaining notation, so he explains his notation uh, for an injection, for a surjection, he explains his notation for an isomorphism, here it is, two wavy lines, uh, and then he talks about a quasi-isomorphism, which is one wavy line, but he has the concept of an isomorphism, and then distinct from that is this concept of a canonical isomorphism. And Milne says the notation throughout the book for a canonical isomorphism, this is on page two of the book, this is, this is in the preface, his notation for a canonical isomorphism is an equal sign. Okay, so a canonical isomorphism is gonna be denoted by equals, which is, which is now going against set theoretic conventions uh, because cannot, things can be canonically isomorphic, 
uh, without being equal, or at least we think they can. That's at least how people are using that phrase at the time. You know, I became mathematically conscious in the 1980s, and uh, that's certainly my belief as to how the word was being used. So now I think, because Grothendieck didn't define it, but he's using it, and Milne is using it, Milne certainly doesn't define it as well. That, that quote from Milne's book uh, was, um, was yeah, from page two, as I say, so there was the introduction and the preface. Uh, there was, you know, there was, this, there was a, you know, a brief section on notation. So what does this word canonical mean? Well, how are we gonna find this out? Well, of course, uh, you know, that we go to the, the source of all wisdom, which is Wikipedia. <laughs> and we, we look at Wikipedia's death because that's what the students are doing, right? Who cares? You know, you're researchers, right? That's what your students are doing. Uh, they are, if they wanna know what a word means, they, go, they don't go to the literature, they Google, right? And goodness knows what they find when they Google, but maybe if we're lucky, they find Wikipedia. Uh, and here's the definition of <laughs> on Wikipedia, uh, and uh, well, uh, so let me, let me read it, right? In mathematics, it says a canonical map, also called a natural map, uh, is a map or a morphism between objects which arises naturally, okay? It arises naturally from the definition or the construction of the object. So, okay, uh, so maybe this is, sometimes Wikipedia has uh, like the end lab, sometimes it has a sort of an, an informal chat first, and then it goes on to a formal definition. So let's read on. Hopefully we're going to see the formal definition of canonical map now. In general, it's the map which preserves the widest amount of structure, and it tends to be unique. Uh, and in the rare cases where latitude in choices remains, in the rare cases where it's not unique, then it turns out that there's a convention, right? The map if it's canonical, it's conventionally agreed upon, apparently. We mathematicians, we have a convention, uh, and we decide that the canonical map is the most useful one. That's our convention. Or maybe maybe not, maybe not the most useful, but maybe the most elegant map. So, okay, now you kind of expect that the, you know, the Wikipedia page is now... This Wikipedia page is tagged as mathematics, right? <laughs> this is filed under mathematics, but but you keep reading, you keep reading, and the de you know normally a mathematical definition it says you know there's some axioms or there's some properties or whatever you know it's the following set, but that that never happens, right? The definition of canonical map does not actually exist, and this for me is problematic. When I was a regular mathematician doing math on pen and paper. This didn't really bother me because canonical map was kind of a state of mind, right? But unfortunately, now I do my mathematics in a theorem prover, and right at this point here, we get stuck. You cannot start telling theorem provers that a map is canonical if it's the most elegant one, right? That's not actually, you know, I've been talking about you know, we're all well aware that you can actually make math the mathematics that's done by humans. You can make it in set theory and you can make it in various kinds of type theory. And these formal theories are very, very good models uh, for what's actually happening in mathematics. But this canonical map, how are you going to make that? Kind of an interesting question. So let me just I want to issue a rebuttal uh, to this to this definition in Wikipedia of canonical map. I, I want to talk about just one slide on some very fancy algebraic number theory. Uh, this is the beginnings of the Langlands philosophy. Uh, this is the Langlands philosophy for abelian algebraic groups, and it's called local and global class field theory. And the main theorem of global class field theory is the, the input is a field, a global field, for example, the rational numbers. Uh, and then the output of this is two abelian groups associated to this field. One you build using Galois theory, uh, one you build using algebra, and one uh, you build using Adele's, the Idel class group. You build it using more analytic techniques. So one of these abelian groups you make using algebra and one you make using analysis. And the miracle, uh, which was observed you know, hundred, over a hundred years ago, the miracle is that these two constructions uh, give you abelian groups that aren't just isomorphic, they're in fact canonically isomorphic. Uh, and in fact, there's two distinct canonical isomorphisms in the literature. There's the first one. Uh, there's the one that Artin wrote down when he was carefully <coughs> writing down what class field theory was. And this one is very popular 
amongst the Hignapont community. And then there's a different one, uh, which is due to Deline. And what Deline, this is an isomorphism of, Abeli, of Abelian groups, right? So what Deline just said was he just put a minus sign in, right? He just, well, let's just not use X goes to F of X. Let's just X goes to F of minus X or X goes to minus F of X because those are the same because F is a group isomorphism. And both of these canonical isomorphisms are widely used. Uh, they differ by a minus sign, they're not equal. And so, so much for this claim that there's a convention, right? This is an explicit example where there is no convention. And once I had to plow through a bunch of papers on global class field theory, because I was writing down uh, some theorems and I wanted to get my normalizations right. And I found that there were three kinds of papers that use global class field theory. There was the kind of papers that said, we're going to use Artin's normalization. There was the kind of papers that said we were going to use Deline's normalization. And then there was the kind of papers that we that just said it was canonical. <laughs> and, and, and those ones, it's kind of a secret which ones those are using. And, uh, and perhaps, you know, perhaps the authors weren't entirely sure themselves. So what's actually going on, right? Is Grothendieck wrong? Well, of course, Grothendieck's not wrong, right? Grothendieck is a genius. There's nothing that's wrong. But what's actually happening is that something is being swept under the carpet. And, and I can be some keen, enthusiastic beginner in algebraic geometry, reading this stuff really, really carefully and completely not notice that at all. But, you know, when you start telling a computer theorem prover about the work of Grothendieck, the computer theorem prover, you know, they, they ask uncomfortable questions because everything you do has to follow from the axioms and whatever the axioms are, uh, if we're gonna, if we're in some situation here where equality is being used in a situation where a perfectly reasonable mathematical statement is breaking uh, the principle of substitution for equality, then you can see we're gonna run into trouble. Well, it turned out actually, historically, uh, We've been doing this for centuries. I didn't actually realize this. It wasn't just Grothendieck that started sweeping this stuff under the carpet. So let me, let me tell you an example of involving the real numbers, right? There's something fishy about the real numbers. And what's fishy is Gauss and Euler and Riemann, they were all working with the real numbers and they didn't care what the real numbers were. They knew what the real numbers were uh, because they, they were, they, this was pre, you know, this was 18th century, early 19th century stuff. Uh, <coughs> They, um, they weren't troubled by set theory and foundations. It, you know, set theory and foundations became necessary when people started asking you know, what a valid mathematical argument actually were, uh, actually was. So when the question arose as to you know, how do the real numbers fit into the foundations of mathematics, how do they fit into, you know, for example, set theory, uh, people started making instructions. And for example, Cauchy, uh, there's, an, there's a, there's a construction of real numbers as equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. And there's another construction of real numbers as Dedekind cuts. So those are two different constructions. And are those different constructions equal? Or of course they're not equal, right? This is exactly, not if you're a set theorist. Uh, so wait a minute. So this is mathematics happening <coughs> over a hundred years ago. And, and, and we're saying that you know, these two constructions are not equal. And yet when we talk about the real numbers, I mean, should we now go back to Gauss and Euler and Riemann and say, well, which real numbers do you mean? We now have got two definitions uh, and we have to say precisely which real numbers you're talking about. Of course, we don't do that. Uh, and, and what's going on? Why do we not care which models these people are using? And that's because what's, what actually happens in practice, what do mathematicians do in practice? Well, it turns out that we have some secret convention. We have a mathematician's manifesto for real numbers and that manifesto says don't start asking weird questions about what's actually going on in your model right you can't take a real number like pi and then say well technically pi is a set because we're doing mathematics in set theory so we could ask about the elements of that set right that is not that is not the way that mathematicians treat real numbers okay we just say just assume they're a complete ordered field and just go on from there right don't ask, don't ask how they're made. Just assume they're a complete ordered field because as complete ordered fields, those two models are isomorphic. And so they may as well be equal. And so you see what's happening is that set theory gives us a, a, a way of asking questions which are valid within the context of set theory, but they are somehow not appropriate questions 
for the real numbers. And what we do in practice is we restrict our language when we're talking about the real numbers, we restrict our language to what we can glean from the fact uh, that they are a complete ordered field. And we don't ask questions about elements of elements of the real numbers. You see, we're not allowed to talk about that because it would be improper. Right? It's not just that there would be more than one answer. We wouldn't be doing mathematics, even though we would be allowed within the context of set theory, we would be allowed to ask those questions. What happens is we, we have some informal refinement uh, where we don't do what we're allowed to do. Instead, we just do what is appropriate. Right. So we, so we informally restrict what we allow as a valid statement about the real numbers. And that gives us more, because we're restricting what we're allowing, we're restricting the number of places where we can apply the principle of substitution, which gives us more leeway in how we can <coughs> treat equality. More things can be equal. So we can treat the Cauchy reals and the Dedekin reals as equal without breaking how mathematics is done in practice. And of course, that's what's happening throughout Grothendieck as well, it turns out. There are restrictions in what we can say when we're doing algebraic geometry. And these restrictions are not formally written down, but as you, you learn algebraic geometry by reading algebraic geometry, <coughs> by watching other people doing algebraic geometry, and then doing algebraic geometry yourself and showing it to your supervisor or your, you know, your teacher. And you learn very quickly what the conventions are. And these unwritten conventions are extremely difficult to pin down, right? They're, 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 they're subtle. It, you know, if you're working in a computer theorem prover and you teach the computer theorem prover the language of set theory, and then you start running some kind of AI on this thing and you give it a big database of theorems and algebraic geometry, and you try and say, well, now just use the axioms of set theory and try and prove some profound conjectures in algebraic geometry. You have no control over whether that computer theorem prover is going to be doing things properly or whether the computer theorem prover is going to be using things which are valid within the formalism but are actually not appropriate in the context of algebraic geometry if you're using equality like this and the, and the way in practice this is fixed in theorem provers is that um is that there's a very rigid definition of equality and uh and the things that Grothendieck is saying are equal are in fact not equal in these foundational systems. These systems have a definition of equality which is weaker than Grothendieck's. So they don't do illegal things, but they can't apply the principle of substitution uh, in times when Grothendieck wants to do this. So you have to work around this. You have to develop workarounds where spe specific cases of the principle of substitution are valid, but you can't use the axiom you have to you know, develop uh, algorithms which will apply these things for you. So this was a thing that burned me. So just, you know, just to end, I have one, uh, two slides left. Uh, homotopy type theory does it in a different way. Uh, so what it does is it posture, it forget, we can't figure out what canonical means. So homotopy type theory says, forget it. Let's just say that all isomorphisms are equalities. I mean, it, it actually expresses this, this concept in a far more refined and precise way, but you know, uh, your, your working definition of uh, the univalence axiom in homotopy type theory is that isomorphism and equality are the same thing. So another way of thinking about it is saying, we could imagine that Grothendieck's equalities are in fact just isomorphisms, but we're allowed to apply the full substitution principle, not just for equalities, but for isomorphisms as well. So we recover Grothendieck's substitution principle, but unfortunately, uh, we don't find the subtle, the subtle concept of equality, this canonical isomorphism, which Grothendieck was claiming was going on. Uh, because in homotopy type, things could obviously be isomorphic in more than one way. So in homotopy type theory, things can be equal in more than one way, which means that equality is all of a sudden a much more unwieldy object. You know, you, we're trying to prove <coughs> A equals B, uh, and then we've got to prove that A equals B. So we say, oh, we're done, right? In set theory, we would be done. Uh, in independent type theory, we would be done. But in homotopy type theory, we might not be done because we might have proved that A equals B for a different kind of equality. Things can be equal in more than one way. And this really happens. You have, you've, you, you're saying to the computer, I proved A equals B. And the computer is, yeah, yeah, but it's the wrong equals. It's the, it's the wrong kind of equals. 
So homotopy type theory will allow canonical is canonically isomorphic things to be equal, but it will also allow non-canonically isomorphic things to be equal. For example, the natural numbers equals the integers. Uh, in set theory, this is probably false. Uh, in Lean's type theory, this is an undecidable statement. In homotopy type theory, this is true, uh, but it is a non-canonical isomorphism. So homotopy type theory has got Grothendieck's canonical isomorphisms as equalities, but it's got too many equalities, whereas the other systems have got too few. So neither of the approaches seem to capture what Grothendieck wants. And so my conclusion from all this, I'm relatively new in this area, but my conclusion is that axiomatically modeling Grothendieck's concept of equality, which is all over algebraic geometry, seems to me to be an unsolved problem. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>